Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our session. What haven't you found? It's a very kind of negative start to uh, the beginning of a conference, and it introduces a topic which really hasn't perhaps had the attention that it's deserved over the last few years. And um, so we shall hear more about this uh, in due course. Um, Roger Thomas, one of the organisers, is with me. I'm Tim Darville. Um, Fritz Lutz is, in fact, in the field at the moment, and uh, therefore hasn't uh, been able to come over and, and join us, but he sends his best wishes and uh, hopes it all goes well. Um, for those of you who like using social media and these sorts of things, uh, the hashtag is here, S571, and you can uh, tweet away on that. There's various other things for you here, and of course the Wi-Fi is available as well. Um, we've got a fairly full program, although unfortunately Chris Evans is unable to be with us this morning. Uh, I'd have to uh, attend to some family issues over in Canada. Um, but I'm going to be filling in with a short paper, which I'm just writing at this moment, uh, to fill that gap, so uh, that might, might help us a little bit there. As I say, this is a relatively new topic, and, and one that uh, deserves some further attention. Um, and to introduce it to us, Roger is going to uh, think about the issue of blank areas and the value of negative evidence um, to set us off. Roger. Thank you, Tim. Well, thanks very much for all coming along. Um, to learn about the, this early, to learn about the joys of blank areas. We weren't sure if we'd turn up to a blank room or alternatively a room full of people telling us we were mad to talk about this topic. Um, so it's good to see you all. Um, traditionally, archaeology has been focused on finding and excavating individual sites and monuments. I mean, that's, that's you know, certainly true in the past and in some places still true now. And so in that perspective, the idea that finding nothing could be interesting does actually seem quite strange. And we, we made the title deliberately provocative. Um, but as Tim said, this is something people have begun to start thinking about, and actually we were uh, fantastically pleased with the range of abstracts that were submitted, because they did show that a lot of people independently seem to be thinking about the same kinds of issues. So we were really pleased about that, and we're looking forward to hearing all the other papers. And I just wanted to look quite briefly at, uh, at why this is an interesting subject, and outline some, outline some different aspects of the, of the topic. Um, and we think that this interest in, uh, I've put the phrase of blank commas in inverted areas because it's a very loaded and difficult phrase, and we'll, we may want to talk more about uh, what we mean by that. Blank areas and negative evidence, which is another way of looking at it, or confirmed negative evidence. Um, we think that interest comes from three linked developments in archaeology in recent decades. Um, landscape archaeology, looking at things in the big scheme of things. Um, kind of linked to that, uh, the theoretical interest in the social use of space, how people use space, use land, use the landscape. And then um, the third thing, which uh, is really probably the thing that's focused at the mind of Tim and me on this subject, the results of very large-scale development-led archaeology, particularly on big infrastructure schemes, um, motorways, railways, mineral extraction, that kind of thing. And we'll all be familiar with the kinds of results that are coming from that sort of work. Um, landscape archaeology doesn't need to say really, is an approach and a methodology which looks at the whole landscape, not just the sites. And it considers how sites and how people and societies operated in a wider geographical context, the way they lived in their environment, in their landscape. And there's been a lot of theoretical and practical interest in landscape archaeology in recent decades. Um, there's a long tradition of landscape archaeology in the United Kingdom, and um, it's been uh, considered in many other areas as well. And there are obvious links to the sort of theoretical interest in the social use of space, people like Tim Ingold with his idea of tasks and things like that. So landscape archaeology is where we're coming from in this, in a way. Um, although it's perhaps worth saying that a lot of our landscape archaeology, certainly in England, um, has been, or the United Kingdom, is about using non-intrusive non, non methods. It's about surveying things that exist above the ground um, rather than about excavating the so these big developments mean you can do excavations on a sort of landscape scale. Um, Development-led archaeology in Europe, again, don't need to say this, it expanded greatly after the Valletta Convention and has led to many huge archaeological investigations. And I, I'm sure you'll all, many of you may have worked on them. You'll all be familiar with the results. And many of them are on large-scale infrastructure projects like motorways, high-speed railways, long-distance pipelines, airports, um, big quarry sites, um, things of that scale, things that cover tens or hundreds of hectares or you know, tens or hundreds of kilometers of linear um, excavation. Um, and because of their scale, uh, landscape approaches are very common in this kind of work, and particularly um, because it kind of mirrors the way these projects are developed, 
approaches which sort of start with the big picture and maybe think we're going to put the motorway there or there and then progressively focus in using um, starting with very broad you know extensive methods and then focusing in down to sort of quite intensive methods like open area excavation but used but used on a very huge scale um, and certainly in England enormous amounts of money are being spent on this kind of archaeology I mean, you know millions and millions of pounds or euros um, even tens of millions on some projects um, and in this process as I've said before tens or even hundreds of hectares of land may be stripped cleaned and investigated archaeologically um, it is really on a staggering scale um, and in some areas uh, like parts of southern England well, which I'm familiar with southern England um, development-led work finds so much that actually finding nothing if you expose a really big area is quite unusual now that's partly because we look in places where we already think that we'll find things but equally um, you know to strip uh, to strip a really big area in southern England and find nothing at all is pretty unusual you know if you if you strip say a square kilometer and that's you know that's um, some projects are on that scale and found absolutely nothing you would really be asking yourself why that was why you hadn't found at least a Roman settlement or a couple of Neolithic pits or yeah. or whatever so um, that that's the kind of thing we're thinking about and so this that issue and work on this scale um, considered in the landscape archaeology has sort of put our attention onto this question of the blank areas between sites as well as on the sites themselves and of course the thing that's why this term blank areas is loaded because um, you know you can use it and just it kind of makes you put it out of your mind if you say it's a blank area but actually they weren't blank in the past obviously they were part of people's landscape they were their fields they were their forests they were their pastures they were almost certainly used in possible very well in ways that are leaving archaeological traces that we don't find or no traces at all and even if they weren't very much used they would still have been part of people's landscape and part of their kind of mental geography and maybe symbolically very important like forests and things um, who knows uh, but you know that's why the term blank areas can sort of lead us in the wrong direction um, and in the past and this is sort of assuming that it was often uncertain if blank areas really were empty of archaeological remains or just because they hadn't been investigated and that's why it's an ambiguous phrase because you say blank area and you're never quite sure if that's because there's nothing there or because we simply haven't looked um, and now and sometimes even if you had looked it could have been ways or in conditions that didn't um, reveal what was there um, but now large-scale work of the kind I've been talking about can give us much more confidence in confirmed negative evidence or true negative and I think Tim's going to be talking a bit more about in, the, in his impromptu filling in of the absent speaker about this issue of true negatives and false positives and all that kind of thing which is a subject a way of looking at things well known from other subjects particularly medicine where you don't want uh, false negatives particularly um, and confidence in negative evidence depends on the uh, largely on the techniques that are used and there is a kind of gradient of confidence if you like um, and there are various forms of extensive survey aerophotography geophysical survey surface artifact collection um, you can have some confidence in those um, but they're very much affected by the conditions by the geology and so forth I mean aerophotography is notoriously capricious uh, it doesn't work so well on some geologies as others um, sometimes crop marks will show in one year or under one crop not under another uh, so I think you have to be quite careful to use aerophotography to say this you know this is confirmed negative geophysical survey works better on some geologies and soils than others um, if you're working on a soil geology where you know that geophysical survey is effective and you're doing it right and it says there's nothing there you can be pretty I think reasonably confident that you haven't missed anything really big and major I mean somebody may shoot me down about that I don't know we'll see um, but um, so anyway there is a sort of grid in you know, a gradation of um, negative evidence uh, of confidence in negative evidence um, diagnostic trenching um, what what we quite often refer to as field evaluation digging a kind of array of narrow trenches across an area maybe sampling between two and four percent of the of the surface um, I think that allows you to identify major sites or the lack of them with a high level of confidence you probably wouldn't miss a Roman villa if you were sampling in that sort of way um, but you 
well, if you were doing it properly. Um, but, you know, if there was, say, a, you know, a very small, rich prehistoric burial or something that was an isolated feature, you might well miss that because it could easily fall between two trenches. But, I mean, typically our trenches are, what, 30, 40, 50 metres apart. So anything that was bigger than that, you would expect to find it um, if, you were, if you were doing it right. But, again, it's an area in which things can go wrong and in which... Um, Overly being overly confident in the results of diagnostic trenching can lead you into problems. So that's something we might want to talk about. Um, and open area excavation, where you strip down to the subsoil and clean it up and look to what's there, will give you a very high level of confidence in the presence or absence of features which are cut into the subsoil. And there is an important issue in that about kinds of archaeology that don't have features cut into the subsoil, which exist entirely in the topsoil and plough soil, and which if you strip it off by machine and then say there's nothing there, well, there wasn't. There was something there, but you put it on the spoil heap. So that's something we might well want to come back about. And I think Chris Evans would have had a few things to say about that if he'd been here. Um, and this sort of follows on from that, the relationship between techniques and the character of the, archae of the archaeology. If, as we're just saying, if the only evidence is artifacts in the topsoil, and you remove it, it'll look as if there's nothing there, that won't be right. And also, some periods have much more substantial traces than others. I mean, you know, the Romans left a lot of pottery, building material, metalwork, coins and things around. Um, so if you, you know, you've got a high likelihood of recovering that if it's there, and if you look carefully and don't recover it, you can be fairly sure it wasn't there. Uh, Neolithic materials, say, the pottery can be much more fragile, um, and it's uh, the features, unless it's a major ceremonial monument, the domestic features can be, certainly in parts of the world I know, uh, can be quite slight, so you could more easily miss those. Um, so you need to think about all of these things when you're saying, you know, is there anything there or not, or how much is there there? Um, and this sort of led us on to thinking about chronological patterns. Um, some areas may produce no evidence of activity at any period, and I suspect that's probably rare across much of sort of lowland Europe, if I can put it like that. Um, and what's kind of more interesting in a way is that other areas can produce a lot of evidence of some periods but little or none of other periods and I think we're going to be hearing about cases in this um, later and that's very important because it's kind of telling us about local and regional patterns of colonization, of occupation and abandonment um, and kind of different trajectories of settlement in different geographical areas and uh, certainly again in parts of the world that I know um, it's quite evident that there are shifts. You have a lot of, say, Bronze Age material in one area, not very much Iron Age, and then it, you know you can have a lot of Iron Age in another area, and rather less Bronze Age. You're sort of seeing these, or we're beginning to be able to perceive these shifts. And because of the scale of work that's been undertaken, we can now be much more confident about saying there isn't material or much material of a particular period in an area. You can be much more confident in detecting those sorts of uh, patterns. Um, we think that sort of focusing on this issue of blank areas um, can help us uh, in both in sort of academic research and in um, to, yeah um, and in heritage management. Um, obviously, understanding the blank areas helps us to understand past settlement and land use. And as we were saying, these chronological patterns of regional and local colonisation with implications for the wider and long-term evolution of societies. Um, and implications for heritage management. Understanding uh, these patterns can tell us what's likely to be found and where, which areas are more or less rich and remains. And if you do find something in an area where, where there is very little, then in a sense it's more valuable because it's more unusual than if you find another Roman settlement in an area where you've already found you know, dozens and dozens of them. And this leads on to something <clears throat> which is very, very important. And this is the importance of, rec and it's something that, that has been neglected, the importance of recording and publishing for instance, in inventories negative investigations it, to say yes we did an excavation here and we didn't find anything and putting that in the record and it's something which I think hasn't been done in the past and it kind of leads me on to the last point I want to end on which is taking us a little bit beyond the scope of this session um, but traditionally and this is gross caricature really archaeology has been about studying old things in a way you almost characterize it as antiquarianism but when you start to think about confirmed negative evidence, it does bring home to us that the evidence that we have 
really is a, depends on the kinds of observations that we make. And I just wonder if we're becoming more conscious of our sort of places in observational science, if you like. I mean, for scientists, it's absolutely standard to record the, the scientific procedures, the way you've made your observations, as part of the report um, on what you do. Um, and and that you know, that's enables everybody to assess the validity of the results. A lot of excavation reports are quite cursory on that. They tell you we excavated a pit, but they don't tell you whether it was done with a, a, a bulldozer, a shovel, a trowel, or, or everything sieved. So you have to kind of sort of guess you know, how much may have been recovered and how much lost. So are we, you know, are we moving towards one where it's just as important to record how we observe as what we observe? Um, and this thing about recording, we did an excavation, we didn't, didn't find anything, I think is part of that. And maybe this sort of interest in um, uh, understanding how our data has come about is, is seen in other areas of the subject, but you kind of these big data studies which are being now done now where you really need to understand the characteristics and the origins of our data. What kinds of looking did we do, and how does that, um, you know, how does that affect what data that we have? Um, so I think I'll stop there. Um, that's the revised program. But you've all got that in front of you. Um, thank you very much for listening. And uh, back to Tim. Right, thanks. Very much.